to Love the Truth Media, a teaching ministry of Pastor Steve Wiseman of Peewee Valley Baptist Church in Peewee Valley, Kentucky. To learn more about the many resources available through this ministry, visit us online at lovethetruthmedia.com. And now, here's Pastor Steve to bring you a special message from the Word of God. This morning, our text comes from the first epistle of John, chapter 1. We're going to study verses 3 through 10 as we examine the topic of restoring and sustaining fellowship with God. Again, that's restoring and sustaining fellowship with God. Reading the text, beginning with verse 3 in 1 John chapter 1, "...that which we have seen and heard declare we unto you, that ye also may have fellowship with us. And truly our fellowship is with the Father." and with his Son, Jesus Christ. And these things write we unto you, that your joy may be full. This then is the message which we have heard of him, and declare unto you that God is light, and in him is no darkness at all. If we say that we have fellowship with him, and walk in darkness, we lie and do not the truth. But if we walk in the light as he is in the light, We have fellowship one with another, and the blood of Jesus Christ, his Son, cleanseth us from all sin. If we say that we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, and he is uh, is faithful and just to forgive us our sins, and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. If we say that we have not sinned, we make him a liar, and his word is not in us. Let us pray. Father, We thank you for your word. We ask that you would teach us and guide us through your scriptures, through the power of the Holy Spirit. We thank you, Father, for your love and your mercy and your grace. Enlighten us with your word. Truly, as you teach us, may we be eager to learn, and not just to learn, but to apply that which you give to us today. For it's in Christ's name that we pray. Amen. In the the first uh, couple of verses... As we talk about this topic of sustaining uh, fellowship with God, I want to take a look at a principle called fellowship with God produces joy. It is a fact, according to the scripture, that fellowship with God produces joy. Now, before we get into these first couple of verses, I do want to say that fellowship is essentially a partnership with God. That's what the word fellowship means. It means a partaker with Uh, That is, we would share with or take part in, uh, literally to have communion or to be sharing in communion with God. So this partnership with God does produce joy. In verses 3 and 4 of our text, uh, John writes here to the believers, he says that you also may have fellowship with us. And truly our fellowship is with the Father and with His Son, Jesus Christ. So fellowship is not that which is with others, the topic we're discussing today, but that which is with God, as John clearly describes there. And then in verse 4, John goes on to say that the writing of these things is, is that your joy might be full. Now, this word full means complete. Uh, we can say that our joy would thus be total or absolute. Our joy would be lacking nothing. Uh, a joy that cannot be improved because it is absolutely complete. Uh, we can only have this kind of joy in Christ and as we are in fellowship with the Father. And we'll talk more about how to maintain this fellowship with the Lord as we go on. But before we get to that, we want to look at verses 5 through 7 and look at another principle. Not only does fellowship with God produce joy, but secondly, Sin interrupts fellowship with God. Sin interrupts fellowship with God. We see in verse 5 that God is absolutely perfect. It says in verse 5 that uh, we have heard of him and declare unto you that God is light. Um, And light, of course, is representative of God's holiness, his purity, the truth of God's word. Jesus declared that he is the truth And in John chapter 1, he is declared as the Word, the Word that was made flesh. So God is the light. He's pure and He's holy. Uh, He exposes Himself uh, to us and reveals Himself to us. And in so doing, 
he examines us and exposes us to our sin. Uh, There is nothing hidden from God's eyes. He is all-seeing and all-knowing. He even discerns the thoughts and intents uh, through his word. God is righteous in every respect. And so the fact that God is light uh, is indicative of his purity. And then we see as well in verse 5, not only is God light, but there's no darkness in him according to the scripture. And it says that in him, at the end of verse 5, is no darkness at all. There's no sin. There are no flaws. Uh, God cannot look with favor on sin. None. Uh, and uh, it's comp- his, his love and his mercy, his holiness and his righteousness. He is completely and absolutely pure and holy just. Uh, He has to deal with each and every sin. No sin gets overlooked. God cannot tolerate any sin. There's no darkness in him at all. So the fact that he is pure and holy and the fact that there's no sin in him uh, leads us to conclude very clearly that God is absolutely perfect. Now, although God is perfect, The next thing we want to look at is that uh, in verse 6, and that is people are imperfect. It goes without without much explanation to the believer. But in verse 6, the scripture says, If we say that we have fellowship with him, this partnership or sharing in communion with him, and we walk in darkness, we lie and do not the truth. Now, as light is a, is a, a symptomatic of his purity and holiness, darkness is emblematic of our sin, uh, and it represents spiritual and moral darkness. We can say that it certainly represents disobedience or rejection of the truth of God. Uh, For believers, um, our imperfection lies in our disobedience oftentimes, uh, where we do not practice the truth. For unbelievers, um, of course, they're not saved at all. They have not put their faith in Christ, and therefore they cannot walk in the light, and they are, by definition, walking in darkness. They're walking in the spiritual darkness uh, of sin, and they're in bondage to sin, enslaved by sin. But believers have been saved by the grace of God, and they have been rescued from the grasp of sin. And so, having been freed from sin, we no longer walk in darkness, but we walk in light. That's God's design. The problem is Oftentimes, and on a fairly regular and continuous basis, we slip into the ways of the world and sin characterizes our life. And the text will bear out the fact that we are not perfect. We are, in fact, imperfect. So God is absolutely perfect. People are imperfect. And the next point in verse 7 is that fellowship with with God requires adherence to Him. This sin in our life, because of our imperfections, has to be dealt with. It cannot be overlooked, cannot be tolerated by God, because He is pure and holy in every way. And so, because of our imperfections, in order for us to have fellowship with God, um, it requires an adherence to Him and to His Word, uh, to imitate Him. Now, we're not talking about salvation here. We've been saved by God's grace from the bondage of sin. But as we've been saved by grace, that one-time event where God eternally removes us from the bondage of sin and grants unto us the promise of eternal life, we are not free from sin at that point in time. And we'll talk more about that. But according to verse 7, it says, if we walk in the light as He is in the light, then we have fellowship one with another. The one with another does not mean Christian to Christian. It means that we will have fellowship with the Father. So if we walk in the light as God is in the light, we have fellowship with God. And the blood of Jesus Christ, His Son, cleanseth us from all sin. Now this walking in the light, of course, walking means our conduct, our behavior, our thoughts, literally our life. If we're living in the light. So if we are, we'll be sensitive to God's Word. We'll be sensitive to God's purity and His holiness as He illuminates us by the truth and He enlightens us uh, by His Word and reveals Himself to us through the power of the indwelling Holy Spirit. Uh, The Holy Spirit indwells every believer. 
and we become open to instruction, and not just to the instruction of God's Word, but also to correction, where we find ourselves contrary to God's Word. God's Word is always the standard to which we must move, and it's the standard to which we must adhere in order to have fellowship with Him. So we have to take the necessary steps to restore or sustain uh, our fellowship with God. And that comes through our obedience to God, obedience to His Word, as we are exercised by this sensitivity that we have to His Word, as we are enabled by God uh, to do so. So, fellowship uh, with God produces joy. Sin interrupts that fellowship with God. Thirdly, in verses 8 and in verse 10, sin is a reality in the believer's life. Now, there are uh, some folks that go around and think that they can't sin anymore because they've been saved by the grace of God, or they believe that they can just ignore the sin in their life because they've been saved by the grace of God, and they have already been promised eternal life. Once you're saved by the grace of God, you cannot lose your salvation. It is secure. It is secured in the portals of heaven. So some people ignore the fact that they have to deal with sin after salvation uh, in order to remain in fellowship with God. But let's take a look at verse 8 as we take a look at this third principle, and that is that sin is a reality in the believer's life. In verse 8 it says, If you say that we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. Now, all believers sin. Um, And it's stated very clearly here, because if we say that we don't have sin, then we're only deceiving ourselves. So denial of sin in our life represents self-deception. The the Holy Spirit and the truth of God's Word through the Holy Spirit will be revealed unto us to expose our sins. And so our sins um, will be made known to us by God. And uh, and and the fact that we have that sin and the truth of God's Word revealing it to us, God, through the power of the Holy Spirit and His Word, will motivate us to control our life and to, not that we can be sinless, because we can't. We are going to commit sin, but that we can do something about that sin in our life. And so God's Word will motivate us uh, to, to be controlled, and control in the sense of spirit control. Uh, one of the fruit, part of the fruit of the Spirit from Galatians chapter 5 is self-control. So the absence of that is a denial that we have sin at all, and we only deceive ourselves. Secondly, not only uh, as we deny sin, it represents self-deception, but denial is sourced in lies. According to verse 8, at the end, it says, if we ha- if we say that we have no sin... We deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. And so any time a believer says that they have no sin in their life, um, then they certainly are, um, are basing that opinion on a lie, because it is not the truth. If we say that we don't have sin, then the truth of God is not in us, according to the Scriptures. All believers sin. Secondly, uh, we look at this sin as a reality in a believer's life, Knowing that we have this sin in our life, and it, and it comes on a regular and continuous basis because we can't live a sinless life, we must admit our sins. We must admit our sins. We can't be in denial. We must admit. Uh, if we deny uh, our, 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 the fact that we have sin, according to verse 10, if we say that we have not sinned, we make him a liar. We mock God. We defame Him. We blaspheme Him. We slander God. We slander His Word. And we reject His Word. We contradict His Word. We have to come to grips with the fact that we have sin in our life. As much uh, as we'd like to think of ourselves as being above sin or being too good to sin, no, the reality is that we do have sin in our life. And the sin causes problems in our life. And every believer... Uh, has sin. No one is immune from the fact that we have sin in our life, even after having been saved by the grace of God. So, um, knowing that 
Number one, we talked about fellowship with God produces joy. Secondly, that sin interrupts fellowship with God. Then we took a look at the fact that sin is a reality in the believer's life. So if sin is a reality in our life, that sin does interrupt um, and and causes uh, causes a hindrance in our fellowship with God. So then uh, the last part of our study today is then what do we do about that? So we'll take a look at verse 9 here in 1 John chapter 1, and the principle that we'll, uh, that we'll uh, examine at this time is that confession of sin is required to sustain fellowship with God. Confession of sin is required to sustain fellowship with God. If we know that we know that we have sin, and this sin um, breaks or interrupts our fellowship with God, then we have to do something with that because God wants us to have full joy. According to verse uh, uh, 4, John said that he wrote these things, that our joy might be full, that is complete, not lacking any exuberance, not lacking any enthusiasm, but it's absolutely uh, complete in every way. So in order to have that that joy that is full, we have to have fellowship with God. If we go back to uh, verse 3 and 4, it says, That which we have seen and heard declare we unto you, that you also may have fellowship with us, and truly our fellowship is with the Father and with the Son, Jesus Christ. So in order to have this fellowship, uh, we have to have sin eradicated in our life, and then we have what's declared in verse 4, full joy. So what does it take to deal with that sin in our life? And that's the, sub, that's the subject matter of verse 9. Verse 9 again says, If we confess our sins, He is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Now, some people think, well, you know, maybe I committed one sin in the last two weeks. Maybe was, maybe a sin or two in the last couple of years. But, you know, basically that's all I'm guilty of. Uh, this verse uh, convinces us that confession is mandatory. Again, we talked earlier about the fact that sin is a reality. We can't deny it. It represents a, a, a mockery of God's Word. We must admit our sins. And so as we admit those sins, we have to confess those sins. Now, what does it mean to confess our sins? The word confess here means to speak the same thing. Literally, we would say the same thing about our sin that God says about it. Now, keep in mind that God is perfect. He's absolutely perfect. He's holy and He's just. He can't tolerate sin. He can't show favor in the face of sin. So God requires us to confess our sin. To confess it means we take the same position on our sin that God has taken. We have the same attitude towards our sin that God has. And that is, it should not be tolerated in the believer's life. So to confess it says, not only that we don't deny it, not only that we admit it, but that we admit that we have this sin in our life uh, to the same perspective that God has on that sin. So we are to confess by way of admitting uh, ourselves guilty of what we're accused of. What are we accused of? We know that we have sin in our life. We're not without sin. So we are guilty of that. To confess means that we're guilty of that. To say the same thing that God says about it. Uh, confession uh, results is a result of inward conviction. The Holy Spirit who resides within the believer will bring to our knowledge the fact that we have sin in our life. God has given us a conscience to understand that. So we're not without the enablement to understand that we have sin in our life. So when we do sin, uh, we don't deny it, we admit it, and then we confess it. And this confession uh, by the Christian, we're talking about Christians now, this confession characterizes us as real Christians. Because those who don't confess their sins, they can live comfortably in their sins, they're walking in darkness. And when they're walking, you're walking in darkness, then you're not in the kingdom of God. You've not been saved by the grace of God. You have not put your faith in God. In fact, if you're comfortable practicing and living in sin, then the power of God by way of the Holy Spirit does not reside in you. And it's an indication that you are not saved by the grace of God.
But confession does help us to understand that uh, we are real Christians because we're confessing our sin. We're, we're searching and we're sensitive to that sin, and then we're confessing that sin. Now, we should continually be confessing because we're not without sin. So every day, every day, we should be confessing our known sins to God. We should confess them clearly and quickly to God. Uh, A lack of confession equates to a denial of the presence of sin in our life. According to verse 10, if we say that we have not sinned, we make him that is God a liar and his word is not in us. It's not operating in us for sure. So confession is mandatory as we look at this confession of sin being required to sustain fellowship. Confession is mandatory. Secondly, God will forgive and cleanse us when we do confess. The scripture says here uh, in verse 10, excuse me, in verse 9, if, if we confess our sins. So the God's forgiveness and cleansing is predicated upon and conditioned by this word if. If we confess our sins, we can't expect forgiveness and cleansing without confession. That's why it's mandatory. But if we do confess our sins, um, then God will forgive the sins that we confess, and um, God will purify or cleanse us from all unrighteousness, according to the verse. So uh, we are uh, to acknowledge the sins in our life that God makes us aware of, and God will make us aware of sins in our life. Then, as we confess those sins, God forgives us of those sins. But then, according to the scripture here, something else happens. As we confess those known sins in our life, and again, it requires a clear conscience towards God and, and, and acknowledging all that sin that God has, has exposed um, uh, in our life, and that we would confess that sin. And when we do that, not leaving anything out that we're, that we're knowledgeable of, Then God does something miraculous. He cleanses us from all unrighteousness. God grants complete and perfect cleansing at that point in time. So this is God's way of eradicating the sin in our life. Known sin should be confessed. If we know it, we ought to confess it. It's mandatory. And we can't just sort of glance over and and be thoughtful of one. We need to be continually searching our heart for known sin. God will bring it to our, to our knowledge if we are sensitive and searching for it. So once God has then forgiven us of those sins that we're knowledgeable of, and then miraculously purifies and cleanses us from all unrighteousness by granting us this complete cleansing, no longer do we need to agonize over sin in our life. But this has to be a continual process. We need to continually confess our sin. No denials. We know that we can't hide any sin from God. We know that we can't ignore any sin from God. If we ignore it or deny it, then the truth is not operating in us, and God's not going to be forgiving, and God is not going to be cleansing us. So as we look at um, this topic of sustaining fellowship with God and restoring that fellowship, it brings joy to our heart. So when God has fully cleansed and completely cleansed us from all unrighteousness, then we have this tremendous abundant joy in our lives. And if you're not experiencing that joy, it may be because you haven't confessed the known sin in your life. But that sin interrupts fellowship with God. It's a reality in our life. And we know that we have to confess it. It's mandatory. And then God cleanses us. This is how a Christian restores and sustains fellowship with God. Let us pray. Father, we thank you again for your love, for your mercy, and for your grace. We thank you for this time we've had to spend in your word. We thank you for the power of the Holy Spirit that operates within the believer to teach us and to guide us into all truth. Father, may we be receptive to that which you've given us today. And we may, may we be serious in the days ahead about applying this truth that you've given to us, knowing that fellowship with God brings us abundant joy, but we have a responsibility Uh, to confess the known sin in our life. And Father, we just ask now that as you give us that joy from 
uh, sin from which has been forgiven and cleansed uh, due to our confession. We pray, Father, that you would continue to prompt us and to encourage us and remind us that this is an ongoing daily requirement. Father, for that person out there today who does not believe in Christ and has not put their faith in Christ, save that soul today. May they repent of their sins and put their faith in Christ, acknowledging that He is the Son of God and that God sent Him as His only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in Him should not perish, but have everlasting life. We thank you and praise you because it is in Christ's name that we pray. Amen.